Thanks. I would say that one thing that we have never learned from history is that these things keep on happening all the time. If you look at two, 2008, if you were sitting in two, two, 2008, you would have heard the world is coming to halt, lending process will not be same, the risks are high, the same thing keep on happening. Even in 2014-15 when the world was doing great, we were talking about VUCA world, lot of un uncertainties. So uncertainties are always there, but when these kind of things happen, we just, human being comes out of these kind of things stronger. So I believe we will come out of it stronger, but as you rightly said, Alok, that we have to set our priorities right. More than geopolitical tension and stuff, the climate change is something which is reaching to a point where it will become irreversible. So keeping that into mind, we have to keep huge focus upon renewable energy and we have to straighten ourselves and need to fight towards a target. You are saying 2030, I am saying every day is counting. Thanks. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, we, we learn, we are learning from this crisis, I think. I will not talk about the reset here, but uh, when you look of, okay, invasion of Ukraine, uh, I think everybody, uh, it, it, it highlights uh, energy security and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, renewable energy play a key role in uh, energy security. Uh, so that's on the good hand. So on the other hand, uh, some country uh, to be able to, uh, I mean, to feed electricity for winter, start to restart some uh, polluting, uh, polluting plant, which is the, the, the bad side of it. Um, with regard to, to COVID, um, I think, you know, when COVID hits, everybody starts to realize, okay, the importance of life and, and so on. And, uh, and I think it raised something on the climate as well. Uh, like, uh, okay, uh, there's, there's diseases, it's dangerous, and people start to think about maybe a more living more uh, healthier and, and be careful of all of those things. So I think it's good to raise awareness uh, on that. Um, so that's, um, that's for COVID, and I had something else, but I don't remember. Um, okay, never mind. Yeah, I think in my perspective, the consensus building has really accelerated. We have reached a stage where, you know, everybody agrees priority is uh, climate change tackling. And in this region, we have seen that, you know, sort of uh, moving away from fossil fuels towards clean technologies. And here in Dubai, we have sort of, you know, an incubation where we have seen a good program take shape, it being proven and a market developed. And if it is extended to the rest of the region, the outlook looks good. Tough times always create some resets and what majority of the organizations around the world have learned after COVID and after all this geopolitical atmosphere, very three evident factors came out. One, there is a race towards energy transition. A lot of energy transition is happening around the world. Second is adoption of digital technologies. People have realized that there are ways to work even from home when you have the right technologies available. And people, organizations need to be prepared for such changes. So a lot of digital adoption is happening. And third, very clearly that has come out is a race for self-reliance. More and more economies, they want to be self-reliant. They want to reduce their dependencies on other nations. And all these three factors together is going to produce some very different significant investments. One will happening in the digital space. And I can vouch that at Aquapower, we have very huge plans of transforming the organization digitally. Second, uh, it will, energy transition will give rise to emerging sectors like ESG carbon credits. And there is a big task force happening on scaling of the voluntary carbon markets. And they are they are forecasting the carbon credit market worldwide is expected to be in trillions of dollars. Uh, the next COP meeting is scheduled to happen in Egypt, which is again showing the dominance of this region. And uh, clearly the resets are happening across the economies, across the organization, and I believe it is for good. 
Well, you, you just mentioned two, two really important uh, events, uh, COVID-19 and um, uh, the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, of course, there, there was an impact in, in, in our projects and the, and the execution, but it's worth it to say that none of this event stopped our projects. So the projects are moving forward. So th uh, that means that we don't have to forget what is our target, is to decarbonize the planet, to reduce the CO2. Um, uh, despite what is happening, uh, our surrounding, we are in a position to still continue with our projects, uh, we need uh, the uh, governments and uh, of taker commitments to increase the uh, energy capacity in the GCC region. Um, EDF uh, Renewable is fully committed with this uh, vision in the, in the region, so we are developing uh, uh, right now two projects and the execution one in, in uh, Abu Dhabi and the other one in, in Jeddah. We have uh, the largest wind, uh, wind farm, Dumat uh, al in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have Diwa 3 uh, under operation. So we have to continue uh, uh, to get success in, in our target. Um, I think we are here the right, the right people to, to achieve that. Yeah, th uh, thank you. Yes. Uh I think uh, the majority of countries, they have uh, set up uh, this net zero uh, target by 2050. And, uh, most of them, uh, part Saudi and Bahrain, or 20, 2060. But in any case, uh, I think before uh, reaching this target, uh, we have to uh, uh, change uh, 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 the way that we are thinking how to manage you know, the, the energy uh, system. And uh, by 2030, I expect that there will be a lot of changes as there is a, a transition period because we have to, uh, to go to a more flexible uh, uh, system with integrating all the, you know, the, the type of, uh, of energy, including hydrogen, including uh, storage uh, solutions, smart technologies. I think, think uh, that will happen by 2030 because we cannot go uh, with this ambitious target by 2050 without changing our, our, uh, our energy system. I think also from the policy side, you know, the regulators have to engage in a more flexible way. Otherwise, you know, with this, uh, you know, uh, quick changes in the technologies, uh, the, the, it's very difficult, you know, to, to follow if we have a very rigid policy and regulations. So the regulators have to, you know, embark in a very flexible and they have also to uh, uh, follow, you know, all those, uh, you know, uh, improvement and uh, also the, the introduction of those uh, technologies. But definitely uh, 2050, it's reachable and we have to act very quickly. Uh, my opinion on this would be like things you cannot predict, which is not in your control, you cannot do anything on that. But uh, what happened with COVID in 2019, there was a little bit slowdown, but nothing stopped. Things moved on, there were projects being commissioned, even in 2019, 20, 21, still projects are going on, there is a constraint, uh, there are hiccups, but things move on. What happened in Russia? People are looking into alternative source of uh, energy rather than being dependent only on oil. So more renewables are going to come. New technology of uh, generating power will, uh, like, will, we can see it soon. Maybe by 2025, something else will come. So things will move. Energy transition will happen. More countries are going to uh, think of being self-sufficient uh, uh, on the energy or rather to export, rather being dependent on any other countries. So things are going on pretty smooth where in the next couple of years, more and more talent migration will be happening. So it uh, looks positive. You cannot predict what is in your control can be done. And that's what uh, the leaders are looking into it. Thank you. Thank you all the panel members. I think uh, everyone, including me, is you know, looking positive. Even in 2022 and post-2022 that, you know, a lot of things positive things are going to happen and uh, on that note you know i would uh, you know conclude this session and uh, you know we have a fundamental choice to make and i believe all the governments and the individuals and the organizations understand that climate change is real and it's happening and the time is now that we act fast and i believe we are in the right 
way and we are progressing i would say uh, very fast and we are going to achieve what's going to you know be the future of energy and on that note thank you everyone and thank you all the panel members any questions from the audience yes i forgot Yeah, hi, good morning. Thank you for bringing all uh, brilliant guys here in one roof discussing this issue, which is a very important issue for the future. Uh, what we have seen like for the past 500 years when the electricity has been discovered, it took another 200 years to, to market. And, the rest. and what we have seen from the 70s until uh, from 80s, we see the computers and uh, uh, the computers and uh, this one, the fourth generation, and uh, plus that we see like uh, the disruption in, 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 in the industry has happened very fast from 1990 until today. When are we going to see the disruption in electricity uh, in the near future? Thank you. If I, if I understood your question, you are asking what kind of disruptions we can foresee in future in the electricity space, correct? Because in the car industry, there's General Motors and a big, big companies, and all of a sudden, uh, this uh, Tesla, he came and he, he make more money than all the whole companies in, uh, exist in the world. So when are we going to see something happening like this? Okay. So I'll share my personal bit. See, disruptions keep happening in various industries. And if you look at this green movement, the entire movement from, from leaving the fossil fuel based generation to a green generation is in a kind of a disruption. You will see more disruptions going forward, which comes from the technologies getting adopted. And there was a debate uh, we, we discussed about whether it's distributed generation or utility space. And I, I am pretty confident that the technological innovations have more scope to play on the distributed side when the generation start moving near to the customers. You will see a lot of demand side management, a lot of digital adoptions, blockchain, which is a very recent phenomena. It's going to be used predominantly in the electricity sector. And any organization which is thinking not just five years ahead of time, but 20, 30 years ahead of time, they are for sure going to be highly valued because they solve the persistent problems in the industry in a very smooth and the cost effective manner. So there are a lot of disruptions which I am pretty confident are likely to come our way and very soon. Yes. Actually, there, there, are, there are two different sectors. You have the electricity sector and you have also uh, electrification, which is more complicated. For example, uh, green steel, uh, chemicals, and so on. I mean, for, for the electricity itself, uh, I'm not sure we, we really need uh, disruption because we already have a lot of technologies. And before we reach uh, a bottleneck on the grid and so on, you do have to invest in grids, uh, in smart grids, and control the demand and so on. But you, today, you know, in the world, we have 10% uh, of renewable energy, and we should go to 70%. So we are very far, so we can already put a lot, a lot, a lot of renewable energy without really reaching uh, a, a bottleneck soon. So what here you, you see is a tipping point uh, because 95% uh, of all power plants in the world, it's renewable energy. So it means that in our world, we are putting in the electricity sector 95% renewable, renewable, renewable in something which is not uh, increasing uh, so much. So renewable energy are rapidly actually replacing other assets. Now on electrification, that's, that's another story. And probably we do need uh, you know, disruption and, and more uh, technology. Uh, that, uh, uh, we'll see that uh, uh, in, the, in the coming decades. I mean, planet of producing electricity does like um, they have their own laboratories and they have their own uh, scientists and they have their own this until today they didn't come with a solution which can produce the electricity cheaper for the consumer I think this 
this energy transition is happening slowly and steadily as uh, you know my industry participant has said if you see green hydrogen is also one step towards that uh, the only thing is you know how to scale big small and the disruption is happening every day and you know there is nothing new which can be done in electricity but i believe if we can store whatever is available is going to be the next disruption prices will also go down as the technology as the technology matures yeah as the technology matures the prices are going to be you know come down as uh, we have seen in solar it's just a matter of time that we have to see so you know it's the same story what we had you know when we thought of landing a uh, man on the moon we did not land on the moon in one go we had to crash at least five to six rockets on that so i think we are in that stage once we have that complete we will be able to land on the moon it's the same story yes that's what Uh, Rami Elias from uh, Rolls-Royce uh, Sustainable Solution. It's like a small question to EDF, Aqua, and Power China. It's like the previous uh, tenders for, from Eldafra, from Sodair, from uh, Neom, like we have a price increase of 15% from 2020 till now. So how uh, developers and EPC are mitigating this price increase? It's like coming from the utilities or developers or EPC. And the second question is like the, the role of the battery storage is still is not integrated in the region fully. So like it's, it's like the role of, of us as developer and, and manufacturer to, in, to introduce it to the region or it's like uh, the regulatory, like it will come from the regulatory sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, um, I will answer your, your first question. I think it's a combination of uh, three, EPC contractor, developers, and of takers. So um, we have a common target. Um, what we cannot expect is that the of taker rely all the responsibility on the developer, and the developer rely all the responsibility on the EPC contractor. So we have to work together and uh, between the three accommodate a new tariff, a new price, but what it's clear for the three parties is that the, uh, there is a change in the, in the market prices, and that this fact will, will affect the LCOE of the, of the projects. The cost increase, whether it's 50% for some or 10% for others, it's very difficult to predict because you don't know what assumptions they, they undertake. But yes, there has been a price increase, and there I will not talk about the specificities, how we are dealing with the problem, but I can say very clearly it's a collaborative effort where off-takers are understanding the, the supply chain disruptions and they have been forthcoming in at least being open to, to hear us out and what are the innovative ideas that can be tried. And the ideas can be one, giving some flexibilities to your EPC partners if there is scope of uh, design improvements, design innovations, optimization, that you can go even beyond the contract and allow them to save some penny, some extra money. Two, it can come from the structuring of the project. Uh, there are ways by which, uh, like uh, Manish Chaudhary, friends from the APF team, they can give you a lot of solutions that how the project finance can be restructured, which can bring extra leverage to you. And the third, which is the most toughest part, is expecting something from the off-taker. Now, some may succeed, some may not, but these are the three, four buckets under which you need to seek and find your solutions. See, mostly the sub everything is back-to-back -back for whatever is the developer front or from the supplier front. Uh, each and everything has its own cost. If there is a cost increase in the commodity part, definitely it is going to increase on the tariff part because uh, from the supplier, EPC, and again, it is back to the developer and then the off-taker. So there are, uh, it was a tough, uh, like for the commodity market this year, but hopefully the things have to be stabilized, new technology optimization will come, better LCOE, so hopefully it should get back to soon with a proper tariff again.
Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Roland Nasrutin. I'm an energy and environment consultant. Um, my question to, uh, to you uh, about, uh, you know, this region, their loss of, uh, I mean, the solar uh, panels in different countries, whether in UAE or Saudi Arabia and others. My question re regarding the, uh, the market and with the, let's say, the landlords or the Amar, uh, let's say, uh, the building construction companies, are there any plans to deploy the solar uh, energy, produce electricity from the solar panels in uh, the biggest residential areas or commercial areas, let's say, like the malls? So, and the second question, what would be the challenges that you might face is it uh, regulations? Is it uh, public awareness? Uh, is it uh, the policies and strategies that the governments are uh, applying is not enough? So, thank you. I'll just uh, add my thoughts to this since I'm in the distributed generation. Yeah, we do have a lot of clients, but primarily it's driven by the economics. The CNDI sector has the highest tariff. So we find that it makes savings for the client when we install a solar generation on a rooftop or on a car park. Now, so malls and all definitely are prime targets. The issue is in when designing it, you should be having enough rooftop space to put solar panels. Nowadays, the new designs incorporate all that or they use car parking. The question of whether we can extend it to residential areas, that is a wish, but if you see the tariffs right now, the present solar tariffs at roughly the residential normal utility tariff. So giving savings to the clients doesn't yet work out. But hopefully this challenge will be overcome as costs keep decreasing. So we should be able to address the residential market. For example, if you see the US market, you know, now there are more than a million homes which have solar panels on them. So it's basically a function of what tariff the utility charges. If we can show a saving and we offer a finance solution, so then the client doesn't have to invest anything and he gets savings. So this trend, if it you know, reaches a stage where the tariffs are more or solar costs drop, we can you know, look at uh, populating every rooftop with solar panels. If I may add uh, just a clarification, because she mentioned also the policy, because it's, it's related to regulations as well. There are many countries, they are imposing, you know, the, the, the installation of rooftop, imposing, <laughs> but they also uh, give some incentives, okay, to um, align, you know, the tariffs and all those things, uh, sensitive things. Otherwise, you have the buildings, there are many type of buildings. You cannot install a rooftop in, 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 in towers. That is, I think, uh, very difficult. But in the villas, yes, definitely. And we have also to engage the architect, architect and engineers from the beginning, from the, the, the conception uh, phase, not when the, the, the villa is, <laughs> as uh, my colleague mentioned, is, uh, is finished and uh, commissioned. So it will be difficult, you know, to uh, uh, you know, convince, you know, the, 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 the customer to install the rooftop. If we integrate this from the beginning, the cost will be very reduced. And if we have, you know, a, a, a conglomerate of villas, for example, 100 villas, the cost will be, you know, less than if we uh, are dealing with uh, case by case. So, uh, and on the other side, in, in the EU, for the buildings, for the buildings, if you know the, the, the owner wants to, for example, uh, 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 engage in this um, net zero uh, target, and he don't have you know uh, enough space to uh, uh, to install the rooftop, what he can do is to engage with a developer and install uh, PV in uh, an array, you know that's nearby or. In, 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 in a field that can be engaged with, uh, you know, the utility or with uh, the, the authority to engage this uh, kind of specific regulations that a building can have, you know, a, a supply from, a, a, you know, a private uh, company or a developer or its own, you know, uh, installation, but can be far from those, uh, from, from the building, so that can this distribute company can also be engaged to transport this, uh, this uh, green uh, electricity. Thank you. Here's the last question from, uh, from there. 
just the last question Yeah, Good hello, afternoon. Shumana Husri from uh, Zenshine Solar. So uh, I will have a question from a module manufacturer side. You mentioned the very important topic of the importance of bringing the factories to the region, uh, which I agree is a, is a hot topic for everyone. But us as manufacturer, we're open. We need investors and we need a pipeline, which is there, but we need also uh, the esteemed companies, uh, EPC developers, to be willing to pay the price of local content. And local manufacturing is more expensive than shipping in from China, despite logistic disturbance. And logistic disturbance is really now. We don't know that logistic disturbance is going to remain throughout time, especially if shift in production goes out of China, then demand on logistic will be lower. So my question to you, yes, we're open. Yes, I'm sure we will find investors, but are you willing to pay a higher price for a quicker response for more security? This is my question to you. I believe the whole idea that we need to have a local manufacturer was to bring the prices down, <laughs> not the other way around. While I can appreciate the concerns that you are raising that, okay, your prices are going up, but I believe it's not just about one project or the uh, other. If you look at lot many projects, when the economy of scale is achieved, why the prices in China are lower? Let's think about that because their economy of scale, they are able to deliver at mass scale. When the same thing happens here, I believe the prices would come down. But if you expect that developers would pay higher prices because you are manufacturing here, unless there is regulatory requirement, that might be a bit difficult in the near future. That would be a straight answer. Uh, my colleagues or my friends can comment from here. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the answer is, is no. <laughs> Nobody will, will pay a higher price. So it's, it's only about regulatory framework. Um, and, and that's it. And uh, as my colleague said, uh, so what you see in, in India is that there is a tax uh, import uh, of, I believe, 40%. Uh, it's 20? 25%, uh, so which is, which is very high. So what you see is that today in the market, uh, before you had a lower APC price and you could uh, sign corporate PPA uh, with off-takers, and today it has slowed down because the PPA price uh, is, is, is higher. Uh, but uh, what you see is that with the technological improvement, now the, the, when the value chain will be better organized, in the coming maybe two, three years, then prices will go down again, or maybe it will go, uh, 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 it will go faster. Uh, so actually, in, in the short term, you do see uh, prices higher, but then you, you, you will see again uh, prices coming down. Karim, uh, you're straight to the point because this is exactly what's happening in India. So, for example, when the fra legal framework came and the tariffs became high, we as uh, number one or one of the top exporters to India, Zenshine is one of the top five in India, now are considering and very advanced into making our factory there. So it makes sense. So then to go back to the wish of the developers for us to come to the area, it has either for them to accept to pay higher, which is not logical and we know that so we're not running or for the regulatory framework to come so you see it's an egg and hen thing we are ready but we need something a trigger so when you say high how high you are talking about is it like 0.5 cents or what's the range I cannot estimate now because first we need to identify the market, right? If we're talking Saudi, it's not like we're talking UAE. So we need, uh, Egypt also is a po possible. So we need to identify market. We need to identify local resources availability in the market, not only as a human resource, but also as a raw material. Because if we're in a market where we can get the raw material, of course, we can be more efficient than others. So it's a whole debate that is very important to be engaged between 
between manufacturers, developers, EPC companies, and government. Uh, and I think the timing is the right timing is now. So uh, this uh, this panel can trigger this, such a so, discussion. So my my answer to you is uh, it is usually led by the governments and not by the developers and. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, for example, there is something called domestic preferences. So there is a whole framework of LCGPA by virtue of which they are inviting players who wish to set up factories in Saudi Arabia. While I don't know the exact details, but if you can uh, be in touch with the authorities, you may find some very exciting pathway for you to set up and, and see that you can cater to this region. Thank you, everyone. I believe the host is getting anxious to close this session, so we should take a break now. Thank you.